Now, a lot of you, I don't know how many of you have been on the lake. If you want to look at these, a couple of screenshots I got from yesterday. If y'all want to just pass them around. This is what you're looking for. This is what's happening right now. You know, I'll try and tell you some things. I'll try and look in the crystal ball and tell you what I think is going to happen, which that's, uh, that's pretty risky, but we'll try it. Lately, I think a huge percentage of fish, I don't care what kind of white bass, what do you all know the catfish, the spotted bass and the stripers, they're really locking into main lake hunts. Uh, I mean, I'm amazed how many fish on some of these high spots. Brush is an asset, but it's not a necessity. With these two screenshots I got, you can see the fish in the trees. These are all stripers. I caught them pretty well, and they were all pretty decent sized fish. They weren't the little ones. They were uh, 6 to 12. So if you're going in the next few days, if you'll concentrate on main lake hunt, big water stuff from Browns Bridge down, this is a numbers game. This is what gets people in trouble, I think. When you pull over one, the fish are decent. They're not going to hide from you so much. They are skittish in that you can't sit there and keep catching them. I've had this problem all week. I'll go over a hump, I'll see this picture, and I mean, it's to the point where you can see it, and you just turn around and just about count your rod down five, four, three, and you get a bite, maybe two, maybe two fish on a rig. That's happening a lot. But they'll spook. It's hard to just keep going over it and over it and over it. I've tried it, it doesn't work. And as much work as it is, as much effort, after you go over and you catch a couple, leave it. That seems crazy. You're leaving fish to find fish. But they'll scatter. If you leave them alone and come back in an hour at that same place, they'll probably be back on it and go back and catch one or two or three. If you can be lucky enough early in the day to pin down two or three places that are holding fish, you start bouncing around. It's running gun fish. You go from place to place, and that's a lot of work. You got to reel the rig out, go to the next place, put them out, catch fish, hopefully catch two, and you keep doing that. So somebody's doing a lot of work, but it will pay off. Think in terms of if you were fishing a red fin. If you pulled up that hump and you throw a red fin out there, most times, if a fish is going to bite it, he's going to bite it. Uh, you know, first ten casts, you, first time you show it to him, he'll get it. Now, you're, and sometimes you'll see a whole herd of them coming up there chasing your red fin, and your tendency is to sit there because you know they're there. You saw them with your eyes. But I think what's happening when you catch one, whether it's with an umbrella or a rig or even a live bait, I think you're pulling them off of whatever they're sitting on. I think they're following that fish, or maybe that the activity that the hook fish is creating is. Uh, spooks them for lack of a better term, but they usually go back. But keep in mind, if you're doing that right now, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Even if you catch one, I'm to the point now, if I pull over a place and hook a couple, I just keep going. I just, since I've got one rod in, maybe both of them, I just go to the next place. Because that's not working as far as beating a place. Uh, what you see on these screenshots, I've got it highlighted. That's a Lake Master chart. I've got everything highlighted between 40 and 60. Everything that's on the shallow side of 40s and white, everything on the deep side of 60, which really helps to follow the contours. And what I'm looking for particularly, a lot of fish will be right on top of the crest, but all these high spots will have little secondary points coming off of them. That's what I'm seeing a lot of fish. And a lot of them are glued into a tree. They're in the brush. I've tried catching with spoons, and I've tried catching with bait, and I'm really having trouble getting the bite of the one, which is amazing to me. Uh, some of the places that I've been going day after day in there, there a majority of the time. I've tried putting baits down, put my trolling motor down, and just easing up there, just dragging the bait right in, and I rarely get one to bite it. That doesn't make any sense to me either. You think a live herring versus an umbrella. Something live, something real, but I, I think it's a reaction bite. I think they want to chase it. I've tried, hmm? yeah, and I've seen that before, and it's still, it's, every time I see it, it's mind-boggling to me. I've tried pulling up to them and dropping a spoon. Which we got to talk about spoons. If y'all aren't fishing spoons, you're leaving some fish on the table. And we'll get that in a minute. But I've tried easing up to this, you know, even with my trolling motor, so my big motor's not running, which I don't think big motors spook fish near as much as we'd like to think we do. That's a real handy excuse. I've used it myself. But <laughs> the more I fish, the more I think for every day a motor scares a fish, there's a day he'll come and see what it is. I believe that. And I'm not sure more days than not he'll come and see what it is. They're curious by nature. But I've tried easing up to these places and wait until I see this picture you're looking at and dropping spoons right in them. I rarely get one to bite it. To go pick it. So it's a trolling bite right now. Why is that? Who knows? Uh, I've had my best luck pulling my rig 110 to 120. I'm pulling a four-arm, three-ounce bucktail rig, 110, 120, maybe 130. Y'all look at the depth of the hump and basing on that and I'm pulling in two and a half miles an hour, nothing fancy. If you see that picture and you go over it, he's gonna bite it. Uh, I, I think the paddle tails, a four inch shad, are producing a little bit better than a six inch twister. 
but I don't see a lot of difference. When you get them ganged up like that, they're usually going to bite. So. I don't know. Yes, sir? What size jigs are you running? What size jigs are we using? I'm using ones or three quarters. Which there is a difference. When you think about nine jigs, and you got a three quarter, and you go to a one, <laughs> a couple ounces of lead, which is going to add uh, roughly two feet to the total depth you rig, two or three feet, which can be a lot. I don't think these fish are real depth sensitive as far as biting the rig, but it, the difference between getting hung and not, which is a huge aggravation. There's nothing worse than seeing this picture you're looking at. And, yeah, and you pull your rig right in the tree before he has a chance to bite it. And then you go back and get it. You're watching the fish while you're bouncing your retriever around. You're watching them leave. So depth, depth uh, control right now is good for, it, it, it's just, it's not, I've seen them coming way up. A lot of these fish I'm seeing will be 25 to 40. And still those fish that are 40, I can get them to come and take that rig. That rig at, at 110, 120 is only running about 20, 18 to 22 feet, somewhere there depending on boat speed. So they're willing to come up, and I've always thought they'll feed up better than they'll feed down. But there's nothing worse than getting in that situation and getting home. Plus it's just time consuming. That's, to me, the mm, the worst part of fishing umbrella. It's just, I hate to go retrieve them. They just can't leave it. Now, I know a lot of people are using braid. Nothing wrong with braid. And you know, you wrap around a cleat and just snatch that tree out of water. Nothing wrong with that either. <laughs> That's easier and quicker, really, than going back and getting the rig. But I, I've used mono so long, and I feel like I've got such a good feel for where it's at and what it's doing. I'm reluctant to change. And I think braid's great. It's uh, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not a criticism. How long will this bite last? Is anybody's guess? Uh, I was. I felt like it was starting to change last week. And we had this big cold front, I really expected them to do something different. But they're on better now than they were before. So nothing's changed. Hopefully we can milk it for a little while. But if you're going anytime soon and you're not doing that, you're, you're missing both. Now there's another real good bite going on. And this one of my pet peeves, it always has been. See how I say, I don't hurt anybody's fan, I'm my dad, I'm, nothing wrong with live bait. My boat will have live bait in it tomorrow. I think you'd be nuts with very few exceptions to go without it. But while you're fishing live bait the next few weeks, and you're sitting there waiting for something to buy, drop a spoon. Well, if you're seeing fish on your graph, drop a spoon. It does one of several things. Well, I had guys say, well, what if I hook one on one of the live bait? Well, where the spoon in? Then get to the end one away. <laughs> what if you hook one on the live bait and one in the spoon? Leave that one in the rod or reel the one on the spoon. He probably won't go anywhere. The only drawback to doing that, he may swim in the tree. He may get enough line off your reel to get in the tree. I'll take my chances. What about if this happens? What if you're dropping the spoon and you hook on the spoon and you create enough activity under your boat that you pull some water in and then they start biting the bait? A spoon, and particularly with the smaller fish we've got, they are an absolute sucker for getting to There's a lot of good spoons out there. I think the Flexit on the air is really, really hard to beat. Uh, the .6 Flexit has been the most popular spoon probably on this lake. And when I say that, you know, I'm, a, I'm the Flexit Spoon Distributor, but I sell a lot of other spoons too. A .6 Flexit Silver Flash will outsell every other spoon hands down, and most of them two or three combined. And I think the reason being that color is good on the near, and I also think that it matches up nicely most times with the size of a thrift and shaft. It's a, it matches a half better. Yeah, Mike. What size tackle do you use? I drop it on 10. 10 or 12 pound test. He asked what size tackle. Now I know you think, oh, striper's 10 pound test, that's too light. No, no, it's not. With 10 pound test, you just have to be a little more diligent about checking your drag and tying your knots. Because if you get a nick in 10, it turns into four and you lose a spoon of fish. So, you know, and you're dropping it in all kind of garbage. The fish itself, when you hook a fish, he'll laugh or he rolls or he gets up under his peck or around his gill. That's a chafe line. You need to check that when you catch one. If he's got the spoon down in his mouth, he rubs his teeth over it, and you've got 10 or 12, you need to check that. The reason I like that. When you're fishing like now, if you're trying to drop that 40 or 50 or 60 feet, heavy line does two things. It slows your spoon down. And I'm convinced most times the spoon works best when it's vertical. If your line's kicked off in an angle like this, or even five or, or eight or 10 degrees, and the spoon's doing this and not this, I feel like it loses its effectiveness. It's harder to feel your bite, and it's harder to set the hook. I want my spoon right there, straight up and down, so when I get a bite, I can just lift it and pull it right into it. And if you've got 12 or 15 or 18 pound test, your spoon won't stay as vertical. And it's also harder to fill a bite, and I think it compromises the action of the spoon a little bit. So lighter line is better. Uh, most spoons come with a treble. For strikers, I like to take the treble off and put a single octopus on it. I think I get more, a better percentage of strikes with the treble. It's nice, too. You get a lot of bonus bites. 
You're going to catch catfish with one, whether you want to or not. I don't, when it gets cold, channels love them. You'll get uh, a lot of big spots, and you'll catch, if you're lucky, a walleye. Or a white bass in our case, which we used to have those. I actually caught one the other day. It's the first one I've caught since October of last year. He's a giant. I hope I tried to put him back in the water and not kill him. So. How far was it for the white bass? Just about the angel marine. He was about 45 feet. So, I caught a ton of little stripers Sunday. Sunday I caught about 50 fish with a trip. Half on spots, half on stripers, and then the assortment of other catfish. I had my walleye, I had a white bass, I got my yellow perch. I truly had, a, I had the Lanier Slam Sunday. I had striper spots, four pound big mouth, a walleye, a perch, and a white bass. No crabbers. I didn't, and I was waiting for that. I, 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 that's the only thing I didn't get. So to Lily, the spoon too. Uh, but in this year particularly, I think the spoon's important because we're going to have so many of those smaller fish. But if you see, you don't have to fish it all the time, but keep one tied on. If you see fish on your graph and there's any density at all, drop the spoon and a lot of times they'll eat it. Does it have to be on the bottom? No. I, you, I like to fish the spoon. I literally like to pick it up and let it hit the bottom. But watch your sonar. And this is why if you look at my boat, uh, my boat's set up just like a bass boat. I've got a bow-mounted sonar unit right there so I can watch my spoon. I started on the bottom, but if you're in 40 feet and you see a fish in 20, he'll eat it if you give him a chance. If you watch another one at 20, look at that. My spoon's in 40. <laughs> He's not going to get it. You pull it up to it, he'll bite it. That's why I use a bait casting reel as opposed to a spinning reel. With a spinning reel, if you're on the bottom, you don't have deep you are, but if you need to pull your spoon up to a targeted depth, you don't know where you're at. With a bait caster, most of them, if you're using an Ambassador 6500, any, any Ambassador reel with a 6 in it, Every time your warm gear goes across the face reel, you're taking out, uh, taking up or giving out 10 feet of line to the inch. So if you're 40 and your warm gear goes across there 130, if you've got a 5500 reel or any reel with a 5 in it, it's 8 foot across. So if you're 40, come up one time, you just brought up 8 feet of line. Do it twice, you're in 16. You don't have to be real precise because then you're jigging it too. You, you know, think about it, your rod's at level with the water, you're holding it at your belt. When you do that, you just lift your spoon six or eight feet. You can, you can pull it into a fish a lot by doing that. But that is going to be more a more viable technique. You're going to catch a lot of little ones. Big ones will bite it. So don't get in the habit of thinking it's a little fish bait because I don't think it is. I think the little ones are just more aggressive. They're also prone to bunch up. And that's when the spoon works best when you got density. Because I think what you're doing is getting a bite where somebody it's just like if there was one piece of pizza left, we might all rush, you know, there's 50 of us in here, I might be a little more prone to get that piece, but if I'm by myself, I'm not in a hurry. Same thing, we got 50 fish. Yes, sir. Uh, Mac, are you waiting to see the fish on the grass over the drop the spoon, or are you just going to an area you want to be off the I'm almost always, if I've, if I've got live baits down, I'm almost always casting or dropping something. Okay. For one, I may be there. I gotta be doing something. Or whatever the, I don't know, I'm sure there's some kind of letter assignment you give me, I don't know what it is. But, it, particularly if I'm seeing it. But I, I, so many times I get extra bites, bonus bites if you will, and I'm convinced that the activity of artificials can create, uh, you can incite a, uh, a frenzy. So, and it's just, and it, how about this? Yeah, if I ever see them, I keep something to cast or drop. But, there's nothing worse than they come up under your boat and you're scrambling for something and they're gone. You got it down there, then they're there, you got it in space. It takes a lot of diligence because a lot of times you're doing nothing, you're bouncing around and nothing happens. But yes, I, I, I tend to be fishing something or casting something. In the spring, if I was fishing shallow, I'm casting a bucktail or jerk bait or something because it's an extra, it's just an extra bait for it. When you're fishing deep, you don't get the saturation. You're fishing shallow and you got baits behind you on a planer board, but I'm throwing something to the bank and I can go between docks or beside a log where I can't drag a planer board. And I think casting's an advantage there. Now everything's under the boat anyway, but it's uh, it's the fifth or sixth bait and it's something different than you got down there. And you have the flexibility of moving it up and down very rapidly to adjust what you see on the ground. Are you bending, putting any curve in your flex? I do not. That's a great question. A flexit spoon, that's how it got its name. It's a bendable spoon. And it. Uh, most people probably do bend them. I usually don't because I don't want to slow it down because if I'm fishing 30 to 60 feet, I want to get it down there and keep it there. If I slow it up, if I bend it, I slow it up, and I'm not holding bottom like I was. There's probably times when that's a good thing, but too many people do it, so there's something to it. 
If you bend one, you'll see it totally changes the action. And of course, there's a lot of jigging spoons out there. The slab type spoon, uh, the flexit spoon, and then you've got a whole other series of spoons that, if you're an old timer like me, a daredevil, somebody remember, or a, a sidewinder, the spoon that fills that place now is probably the Nichols flutter spoon, which is a really nice spoon. It gives you a totally different look in the water. So sometimes that's good. I wouldn't be afraid to change with that. I usually start with a flexit, and it's hard to beat, but not limited to. I really like that flutter spoon that Nichols makes. I've had some good luck with that, and going into the winter, I'm expecting more for that. The other reason, yeah, Mike. Have you used any of those tungsten spoons, you know, because they're, they're smaller, but they're heavier? And yeah. What are they? What can't afford them. them. <laughs> I can't afford them. They're not my budget. <laughs> no. Tungsten's great. It's got an application. I, I just thought maybe, you know, when they're hitting on those really small threads in the winter, they might. I was going to say, it's going to have an advantage when you need to downsize. <laughs> Because when you start talking about little bitty spoons, a half or certainly a quarter, it's hard to get it to hold bottom in 40 feet. You can't feel it. It's hard to catch a fish with. Crappy like those little spoons when they get deep. But, you know, but that's where they have their application. Really small stuff. And they, they're good baits, I mean, but they are expensive. Yes, sir. How big is that flexit spoon you're talking about? Uh, it's made in four sizes a half ounce, a half, and then a point six. I don't know why they chose point six, and then a three quarter and a one. Uh, I don't, the, the half and the three quarter, if you look at them in the store, they're completely different shape than the .6 and the one out. The one, in, the .6 and the one is a flatter, broader profile, and I like them better. I feel like they do better. I don't really like the three quarter. I don't like the shape of them. Hopkins spoons is all, uh, always a good choice. That's been around forever. That will work here nicely. They're pricey, but they work. They're a chrome spoon. I think some of the colors that Flexit has, too, do nicely on this leg. And the other reason you need to keep a spoon tie on, this is you, everybody thinks it's, it's great, it's application is to be fished vertically. <coughs> it's one of the best things in the world to cast a school and fish. Everybody wants to throw top water or school and fish. I do too, it's fun. It's cool to see them in. A lot of times it, it'll get a bite. But if you think about it, they're pretty inefficient. How many times have you thrown it right in a big herd of strikers? They'll knock it around. It's great fun now. He'll waller on it, he'll push it around. But he won't get hooked. How many times when you did get hooked, you get him up here, and he's used every stinking treble hook you've got. He's taking full advantage of it. And they're still out there busting, and you got to deal with that. And the ones that aren't in the fish are in the net. And you got to remember, too, as a guy, you know, I've always trained, I'm geared for numbers, man. I want to get them. And you know what I'm talking about on this lake so many times. When you've got fish on top, you better make it happen, because they won't stay there. Sometimes you get one shot. So I'm, I'm in that mindset, too. A spoon does several things, and a bucktail falls in this category, but it doesn't fish as well vertically. This is where a spoon has more uh, well-rounded, practical applications. It casts very well into the wind, especially that one out. If you can punch a hole in the wind, it'll go. And the one's not too big. It, and right now, particularly, if you look at a lot of our threads, they're about that big. They're really locked in on the threads. That one is a good size right now. Particularly, it's a good matchup. Cast well, and what I do is the fish are actually on the top, and I can see them with my eyes. I just reel it across the top, it skips across the top, you get a lot of good response in. When one bites it, particularly with that single treble or single hook as opposed to a treble, you get a real high percentage of strikes with hookups. And when you get him in the boat, you can wrench that hook out and swing your spoon right back out there. The other advantage of a spoon versus a top water, and you've all had this happen, you see a big wad up on top, and about the time you get right here, they go down. Okay? It's hard to pull that fish back up to the top water in most cases, or a lot of cases, particularly if it's over open water. When he's starting to sound, he's got a pretty big playing field there. So when he, I mean, if he's pushing bait down, there's no reason, and if there's bait around, there's no reason for him to come back to your one top water when he's got a thousand shad, whatever. Spoon, you can throw it out there and just put your reel in gear and let it sink. Drop it right down to where they're at. Because they're usually, if you're that quick, they're not too far. And they're still biting, they're still feeding. They're just not willing to feed on top. So, uh, spoons, I think, are highly underutilized by striker fishing because it's a bass bait. Nobody's ever told the striker yet. <laughs> what size and style hook are you putting on these spoons? I'm putting an octopus hook on them. And I'm playing around with the circle, and I've had pretty good luck with the circle, but I'm using the same octopus hook that you're putting on your live bait. Uh, usually I'm running like a, a one off, most times, maybe a two on, that, on the one ounce spoon. But I've had good luck with the hookup. Do you have a question? You're just stretching up there. 
Try that. And when you're sitting around with live bait, watch, because it's going to happen to you repeatedly, I think, this fall with all these little fish. Yeah, I know you guys sometimes you're fishing turn, but you might not want a little one, but what the heck? You won't hurt a little bit. Never know what happens. It's, fun. it's a It's another pull on the line, and you never know when there's a big one that you, you get his attention, or that little one kicking around, you trigger him to come over and eat one of your baits. And the big ones will bite his spoon, too. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. You don't catch a lot of little ones. Just because if you don't catch a lot of little ones this year doing everything you're going to do, because they're big enough now to eat your herring. We've all seen that. They'll eat a herring. They're big enough to eat almost anything that we fish with on a regular basis. So they're just going to dominate the crib. So the spoon is not the spoon's fault. It's a good thing. Look at it like that. Uh, the other thing that I would urge you to keep tied on a lot of times is a bucktail. Bucktails are really underutilized. I think it's the consummate artificial strike bass movement. It's not the only place I don't like it is fishing it vertically. Hopefully, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen enough fish on the top of the water to fill up a five gallon bucket this year. Uh, I think that will change. I think the reason, and a lot of you might have noticed the last three or four years, it's hard to catch a fish out here with a red fin. That used to be a really good pattern. Um, in the spring, when the water would rise to 60 until it got almost to 80, we'd usually have a top water bite. It would have varied in intensity and it might be stronger on in one part of that temperature range and the other. You had the same thing in the fall, the converse of that, when you went from 80 back to 60. There was, I can remember lots of times I'd go out on the lake, I wouldn't carry anything but red fins. I'd go to hump, I'm a red fin, go to point. It was a numbers game, but most times I could make it work. That doesn't work for me anymore, but I think it's because of the decreased volume of fish. The competitor, the competitive factor is taken out of it when you don't have big schools of fish. You guys can remember going back the summer of well, I don't know what, six, seven, eight. Yeah. You got the big, the spaghetti, you know, yeah. big schools of fish. I've seen it where your graph would tell you it was 22 feet deep and it was 100. And right. you couldn't shoot a signal from I don't have that problem anymore. Most days, <laughs> you know, I, I, it, well, Tom and I have talked about this. I had a herd of them under my boat. There must have been 50. That's a lot of fish now. I used to, we were looking for, I know. That's going to come back. So some of the patterns that we've seen kind of, that I think have lost their effectiveness, will come back with the increased density. I think uh, of what used to be a really good pattern uh, may start as early as Thanksgiving, going all the way in the spring. He's going back to the creek full of bucktail. Well, where there was bait. It reminds me of Don when you say that. Don. Oh, yeah, yeah, my good buddy Don, yeah. He was big on bucktails. He did a lot of casting. And so you guys got to remember, I've been here so long. <laughs> How long? How long? Hey, 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 hey. I was waiting. I was slow. I was here before we even had stripers, if you really want to know the truth. But I was also way BH. That's before hand. Right. We had we had these artificials, or you had to use a brim, or you had to go throw a net. And sometimes throwing a net, it was really hard to catch shad a lot of times. So I had to do all this other stuff, or didn't catch it. And that's probably why I cast as much as I do. It's I inadvertently trained myself to do that. But used to, you could take a, like a 3 8 or a quarter ounce bucktail, tip it with blue, go in the back of the creek, a lot of times drag a couple live baits back, just beat the bank. Catch lots of nice fish, catch a few bonus bass. We had white bass in, catch a lot of white bass. I think that will come back just that, because that's of the numbers. That's what we used to do. That was in the. <laughs> they would run those points and, uh, you know, they would bang up in the shallows. And uh, just because they were chasing those freshmen. Yeah. He didn't have the blue back. No. He didn't take them to deep water. No, and that's changed it. So hopefully we see that come back. To some degree. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Did you just fish it plain or you put a fluke or. I, I like to tip it with a fluke or something. I think it adds a little. Uh, uh, I like the, the bigger profile. It slows it down a little bit if I'm trying to fish it in shallow water. And a fluke gives it a little bit of buoyancy. The one yeah. with the paddle tail or the other? I just like the plain old blue for the paddle tail. And there's a lot of good baits like the... Uh, now we've got so many neat plastics to choose from. You know, I started, we did. And I remember fluke was a big deal when it came out. It changed fishing. It really revolutionized fishing. But some of the... Um, uh, I call them the pervert baits. The uh, uh, reaction innovation baits, you know, that all have uh, a pervert thing for lack of a better. They are really good. They make a really good trailer that does well on a bucktail. Sometimes it's like a three inch shad body. So play around with that. But day in and day out, it looks really hard to put it down. It's a good trailer. Yeah, I, and I kind of let, did y'all have any other questions about umbrellas? I kind of skipped over that. If you do, 
And is there any other questions? Yeah, yeah. One of my umbrellas has three eight ounce jigs. If I want to put some weight on there, can I put a, a egg sinker up on top of a swivel? Is that a good way to weight it down? Yes. Level? You know, if you look at a three eight ounce jig or half <laughs> or three quarter, yeah. there's really not a lot of, not a lot of difference in the physical size of the bait other than the head. Right. I don't think the fish can see it. So the, the biggest advantage of having a larger jig is the weight if you need to get the rig deeper. But the bigger hook handles the plastic trailers better and it hook, I think give better hookups. So there's a little bit of advantage. But other than that, no, if you add an egg sinker to your rig, he, don't, he does not care. This is not for that fishing, he's not going to see the egg sinker. And, as, and I don't know which rig you're using, but you probably are adding 10. With every ounce of lead, you're adding about Probably 10% to your depth. That's yeah, right. Twenty years of the shark tooth trailers on it, and like three eight ounce jigs. Okay, you're probably adding, uh, yeah, 15%. If you took that depth chart, yeah. and you got you want to send two ounce egg sinker. It's a four arm, eight jigs on a nine jig. If you have to check one down the middle, and there are three eights on the on the arms. Okay, yeah, you're at you're at 10, 15%. Just make sure you go connect it. Yeah. Let it slide. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I put yeah. Otherwise, you'll never get it out of the tree. Exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah, because it'll it'll uh, it'll separate from the rig, and it'll do this in the water. The rigs over here, okay. and the sinkers here, and you can't move the retriever on that point. The so coils will see at the bottom, but I need some on top to keep it down. Yeah, pin it with uh, a, a toothpick, or a lot of guys will take. This is a lot of rigging, but have a swivel, a little piece of mono, a little piece of mono, and a swivel between the rig, uh, the sinker between the rig and the sinker. Okay. But a toothpick will usually. Particularly with the size line we're using with rigs, yeah. mono especially, the big pick will take it, hold it fine. So, yeah. And, and, and that should work fine. I don't think they'll see the difference. Well, they make those trolling sinkers with the chain out of both Yeah, I'll say those, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's an effective way. Or a lot of guys will take a really big bucktail and put it in the center, like a two or three or four ounce. Okay. Same thing. General rule, an ounce of lead gives you 10%. Okay. That's rough, but that's a good, good place to start. Yes, sir. You pull mono or braided on your new rig? I use mostly mono just because I've done it so long. What pound test? 50 usually. 50? Mm -hmm. 50. 40 or 50 pound mono. Yeah. I don't, don't like to go any light. I know you're going to get hung up, but do you use the, yes. the jig to get it unhung? Or? Yeah, Jerry Hester, one of the other guides, yeah. makes the retriever, and I wouldn't go on the lake without it. Because okay. what you just said is not if I'm going to get hung. When am I going to get home? You're going to get home. You buy the retriever first. <laughs> <laughs> I, broke, I broke 200 <laughs> right off the other day, so get over yeah, If you can't afford the retriever, you can't afford the retriever. Right. <laughs> yeah, if you don't, it's just, you're going to get frustrated because you're going to, it's just not practical. It becomes expensive when you start busting those off. We caught a bunch of fish on uh, the new rigs, but they're still all small. Same thing, plant a board or whatever. I, you know. We tried it. I jumped up a 200 pound braid. You still broke it off wrapping around the cleat. But uh, I think, what kind of reel do you suggest with a counter? Uh, gosh, I don't use counters. I use a pin. For the use, how do you use Good. your confidence? You're going no, no, back no, 120 no, that's, feet, no. 150 feet? No, that's guessing. Put on a 320. Every time as you're releasing the line, yeah. Every time your worm gear goes across the face of the reel, you're going to have 10 feet of line. Every time it's what now? Every time when you're paying the line out, watch your worm gear. When it goes from one side of the reel to the other, you just gave out 10 feet of line. 10 feet of line, okay. So 10, 20, 30. Oh, okay. And if the reel is full, that's incredibly accurate. I mean, I measure. The only drawback with that technique, if your reel's not full, it's probably not a full 10 feet. In terms of repeatability, if you know you went out 12 times, and you go back, you're in exactly the same place in terms of repeatability. It's accurate too. Oh, okay. Now, a lot there's some good line counters. I think that Daiwa LC line counter is a good reel. It's got pretty good drag on it, and that's that's I, I want a good. I drag. want to use the pin thing I do in a lead cord, but you know they don't have a counter. On. Okay, if you if you're using a 320, there's that's your counter. That's what I use. Okay, and you know the Akuma line counters are good reels, and uh, doesn't uh, doesn't the 320 have a line counter now? It does. Like, yeah, yeah, I think it's all never used. I've never used one. But see again, I'm 330. 330s an excellent reel, and they're good, tough reels. I, that's the other reason I like the 320s. I like the 320s. Pretty, pretty dependable reel, and yeah. uh, fairly affordable by the day standards. So if it goes across, it's 10 feet. Yes. Okay. One time. One time, right there in back. Yeah, that you get the trick route. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one time, across, 
but it is very That's a lot cheaper. It is. Yes, sir. Uh, you said earlier that you were trolling um, at 2.5 miles per hour. Is there a range that you like to stay in? Yeah, if I had the gentleman asked what uh, I mentioned the speed two and a half miles an hour and do I have an optimal range? And I, if I had to pick a number, I'd pick two and three, you know, 2.75. Uh, but that's more of a depth control issue than it is to tweak a bike. They'll run those things down remarkably quick. But if you're, yeah, you know, you think about it, I don't know how fast a striker swims. That's a question we need to ask Patrick. But to get from, you know, here to there to eat your rig, he can, he can turn on the afterburners and you probably don't want to pull. The problem when you start going fast is you start lifting your rig. Now your depth's distorted. So where we were 20 and we bump up to 3.8, and it's a, you'd be amazed. We learned that when we did our depth chart. You tack up, man, that thing's coming up hard in the water. You're pulling it up. Now you're lifting it above the fish. So that's the drawback. Wasn't it? Now, and a lot, and I'm, I'm playing with this a lot. Well, like if I was fishing humps, like I was talking about right now, and I've got two that are, say, a hundred yards apart, and it's real, and I go over the first one. It's really not practical to clear all that mess and run over there. It's easier just to troll fast. Mm -hmm. But I might bump up to six or seven miles an hour. You'd be surprised how many times I've had one eat it. Wow. Yeah, they can, and, and almost, or maybe I'm trolling over one of these humps and. Um, Chris made us a new crappy hole, and I didn't know that brush pile was there. And I look at my grab and like, oh, I got to get, I got to get my lift over. I got to lift my rig up and over that. Thing. So I shower down on it. And I'm going just about to the point where I'm about to start coming out of the hole and want to just rip the transfer. So, and so you think you're hungry, but you're yeah, yeah, that yeah, because at that speed, the, the bike's violent, you know, it's, uh, and there's not you're going so fast. It's the drag's fairly continuous as opposed to the perky jerky motion you get when you get a fish on there at two miles an hour, you're going 15 and it's solid. <laughs> and you think, oh, I got the tree, and you stop at the So don't worry about that, but just remember when you change your speed, you're altering your depth. I mean, you're just going a half or three quarters of a mile. You also got to factor in the wind. I've seen this a lot. If you're trolling this way at two and a half, and you've got a nice, you know, even just like a 10, 12 mile an hour breeze behind you, you turn around and go the other way, that's affecting your speed, which is affecting your depth. That's why sometimes guys say, you know, I don't want to catch them when I'm going that way. That may be how the fish is positioned, but a lot of times I think it's because it's, you've got the speed factor. When you're going that way, everything's tweaked. When you're going another way, it's not. So, but they're pretty finicky about that. Yeah, Mike? Uh, I just wanted to mention, you know, I recently got a new motor. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, <coughs> I did not control work up to two. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize that, you know, uh, on, on the saddle, there's a pensioner that's in there that can be tightened up so you can make it stay where you want it to stay. Like I was having a hard time getting it to do, I like 2.8 on controlling speed. And if it was like, you know, how you put it in gear, like an idle, it was like a 2.1. And then if I put it where it would stick, it was at 4.3. You know, so I was like, I had to sit there all day long. I mean, I was sticking you know, door stops in there, pliers in there. I was drilling holes in there, sticking nails. I mean, and you know, that, that, I finally took my phone in for 20 hour service and I said, there's a screw, you can tighten that up. Yeah. So if any of you, are, any of you have a problem with getting your boat control at the speed you want, you can tighten up that thing. I said, tighten it up, so I gotta lean my body up against that door for it to move it. Yeah. Where I, put it, where I put it, I want it to stay there. And most of them have that, yeah. I'm having a problem because I got a newer motor that uh, What is it? It's a show motor. The yeah. Show motor. Yeah, it's a great motor. Does that? That's not too bad. Yeah. Do you, do you think? I mean, am I out of? I mean, do, should I just let another thirty yards out to accommodate? You're either going to have to put something on the boat to slow it down, or what you just said. I don't think yeah, three three is too fast. Yeah, but yeah, you're going inside Mike. Uh, yeah, he's going two eight, and yeah. you're going three three. He's fishing deeper than you are. Oh, yeah. So yeah, so you've got to let out more line or drag a bucket or So how much line would you say would make that difference? Thirty uh, feet, forty yeah. feet? So we're talking about half a mile, I'm gonna guess twenty or thirty feet to it. That's right. But that tells you how dramatic it is. Half a mile would seem like that's a lot. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it affects the speed dramatically. It really does. I was shocked. So uh, and when we did the depth chart, that's in, the depth chart I'd like to tell you we had some really cool equation and go ahead. No, I, I, I think you're better off <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes it tweaks the bottom. Sometimes, they, and I think that's what's going on. They would chase something. You think a uh, big fish, big water fish sitting on that hump, 
here comes your umbrella or umbrellas. He's got to make his mind up pretty quick to either eat it or let it go. And that's what I think's going on. When I drop something in him, he's got all the time in the world to look at it. It's a trick. I'm not going to do it. Here comes the umbrella. This quick. I got to do it. I got to either do it now or I'm, I miss dinner. <laughs> Usually, once that first one turns, something's wrong. Yes, and well, uh, Ken made the comment. Ken West made the other comment. And he's been doing the same thing, and he told me he's had this happen a dozen times, where he hooks one, and you tell, you know, with the tackle we're using, it overwhelms a little fish. But you see your rod, and you got that little one, and then all of a sudden, bam, the big one gets it, and you'll he'll have a, a one of those 18 inches, and then he'll have a 15 pounder. So yes, if you get the first one to bite, I think everybody else is going, hey, wait a minute, what's going on? He ate, and I'm not. And in their world, you eat what you can, you get left behind. So there's a, there's a lot of merit to that. And that, that's I, I think that's the only explanation right now why they bite a rig and they wouldn't buy all this other stuff, because it's moving and it's triggering that reflex. It's a reflex bite. Okay, what about some of these bigger rigs that you can buy? Like you see these saltwater teaser rigs, it's got yeah. like, six arms on it and three drops. <laughs> I mean, have you ever tried, does more bait, more lures, is that better? Or is that just, I mean? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Have you tried that? I've played around with some of the bigger rigs. You know, there's some made, I don't know if y'all wear this, but there's umbrellas made there. Just, this wide tip to tip. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. You do it cost $300. Yeah. 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 It's right up there with tungsten, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah there's some merit to that because I'm convinced, you know, the whole object of the umbrella is to create the illusion of a school of bait. A bigger school is better, right? Nine's better than five. Well, yeah. theoretically, 15's better than nine. Those guys also that invented, invented that ain't fishing where there's trees. <laughs> They're fishing those. But yeah, there's some merit to it. Where, where, the, where we cross the line, where this is the practical, I don't know. Uh, I've tried that, and I've also tried and had some luck with this. Putting it where you got your first umbrella, and you got your long wheel coming out of the middle. Take that off and put a second umbrella behind it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. But what Mike said is a problem when they get hung. You usually lose one off unless that middle leader's really strong. Because they're, 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 you can't get the retriever to the bottom rig. But I played with some of the bigger ones, and I really didn't catch that many more fish. Uh, and their logistics are messing with them. They don't store well. They're not in our, they're, they're cumbersome in the boat. So where we're at now with size is probably the we're before we cross that tipping point. Yeah, there's more good to, to a degree. Yes, sir. You ever troll those uh, big imitation trout or something like that? Yeah, I played around with a lot of plugs and uh, not you know like maybe like a big a, plastic, like a, the big well, a big plastic hard lure or like a the real pricey swim baits. The the, the rubber ones. So. Okay, yeah. Those I haven't pulled those probably as much as I should. They'll work. I've had a lot of luck over the years pulling diving plugs, specifically a Cisco kid. You know, that is a that's a musky plug, and you, they're hard to find here actually, and the application is limited. But that one, uh, Storm used to make a plug called a Big Mac. That's not the only reason I pulled it. I promise. Just <laughs> but it was a big diving plug, red fin. There's a red fin that's got a diving bill on. It's the most impossible to find, but it handles speed because you need plugs that handle speed pretty well. And all those plugs did really well. I've caught them pulling them on lead core, and I've caught them pulling them on the downrig. But when I've done best with them is when I'm fishing super deep. Or in low light condition. Used to, this is again back in the dark, this is V8 before we had hearing. I did a lot of night fishing, and one of my favorite things to do in the late summer was to pull a big diving plug on the downrigger at night over hunts. Caught a lot of really, really nice fish for the Cisco Kids or that Big Mac. Um, I, the stretches, I never I never pull them much. The stretch 20 or stretch 30 will work, but on the downrigger, it defeats the purpose. The downrigger controls your depth. The stretch plug is the depth control. But they work. Though they've got some application, we probably don't use them enough, but that's been my experience, and I think what's happening, bucktails don't work well at night because a bucktail is more visual. That big, you take a big diving club, and it's displacing a lot of water, making a lot of noise, and I think they feel it through their lateral line. I think sight comes into play at the very last instant. He knows it's over there, he can feel it. He knows something's over there, she comes over and sees it. Whereas a bucktail, he doesn't know it's there. I've, I've caught very few fish trolling with a bucktail. And you, I would troll during the day with a bucktail, catch them fine. And then when it got dark, I'd stop catching them. 
and I put the plug on and start catching. The, most times when I've caught fish in the day with a plug, it's when I'm fishing in depths of 30 feet or greater, which is low light condition. But yes, that has some merit. And uh, you might want to keep a couple of Cisco's in the boat and put them on Lake Moore or down there in the summer, but they'll catch some nice fish. That's a good pack. What about the hard clutches when they join the fish? Yeah, well, Chris wants to know if we were playing around any with the hard, real expensive swim baits like a bull shad or Stickleberg, Swarming Hornet, Blue Back. That's a really good one. We know they eat them. There's a bass fisherman gripe about them taking away from them all the time. You know, they're complaining. But they're throwing them all the time. So 20 pounder takes it from them. Yeah, we know they eat them. And they, they probably are really good bait to troll with. I haven't neglected that, to be honest. There's no reason why they wouldn't work. Well, that's, that, that's probably why people want to play. You know, that bull shad, a custom bull shad with this custom pants, $100 swim bait. Yeah. So if you're dragging two of those around, we're dragging $200 in bait. And that's, uh, you know, we went, just went to 400 pound break and we can't afford to lose it, aren't we? Uh, but they work. Yeah. And that, I, I throw a lot, a lot of them try to a Seville Magic Swimmer, which is a really, really good swim bait. And it's, by today's standards, fairly affordable. The strikers will eat it. So, yeah, they would probably work well and they'd probably do really well on a down regular or a lake and we need to play around with it a little bit more. I, I, I've been, you know, there's only so much time to goof off. And I like doing stuff. I like playing with different stuff. And uh, sometimes it's a failed experiment. That's the one that I'll tell you all about. And sometimes I hit on something that actually works. But yeah, those plugs work, but we probably need to play around with it more. And the swim baits. I mean, you look at those things, gosh, they look like a fish. I mean, I would eat them. Yeah. Mac, have you used those uh, Cisco Jakes, the slab sided, the big flat sided Cisco? Oh, yeah. It's like a, like a grandma. And, and that same plug. Yeah, I like those. They don't dive with the flip though. You got to put them on a rigger or lead cord. Right. But they, uh, gosh, I should have brought one to show you. I didn't think about it. But there was one, Cisco makes one, and there's a plug that comes out of North Carolina called Grandma. And they make them as big as 18 inches. They're beautiful baits. But I've actually done pretty well with those when it's hot, pulling right. it on the rigger. Right. But it doesn't dive. No, I, I, Six, eight feet maybe, so you gotta put something on there to get him down. Yeah, we probably, in the other other bait we need to play around with more than we've neglected, if you went to somewhere like Smith Lake up in Virginia, those guys don't pull box out, they pull bunker stuff. How many of you ever pulled a bunker stuff? What'd that look like? Uh, it's uh, it's different than something like that big Parker spoon. It's a. Looks like a tenon, you know, baby. Yeah, it, it, it has more of a saltwater bait. It's very light, looks really good in the water. And it's like a Tony Asetta spoon. Most of them have this, the, the uh, hooks actually screwed in the, right. the blade. But they look good in the water. We need to play around with more. I've caught some fish with them. I've neglected that too. I assume you like to pull two U rigs at the same time. Yeah. One on either side of the boat. Yeah. Are you purposely you purposely put one down at a different depth, and so you're covering different water columns, or are you? That's keep a them great mixed? question. If we're pulling two rigs. Do we want to stagger them? And usually not. Because if they're staggered, that's when they get hung. If I want, you know, if I go over a place and I see them and I'm gonna twist back over again, you can be pretty aggressive with your rig. You can make a 180 real easy if everything's equal. Your line size is equal, your rigs are equal. If you're pulling different weights or you got them at different depths, that's when you're more prone to get hung. Now, what I will do sometimes, particularly if I'm not uh, dial in and I don't really know where, I, what depth I'm looking for, I'll fish a third rig, but I'll make it either decisively heavier or decisively lighter and fish the lighter one way back behind the other two. Max attack. Yeah, yeah, the max attack. What we call the max attack. Or I'll fish a big heavy yeah. one right there under my motor where they never get tangled. And that gives me the ability to probe different depth. Then the Mac attacks he's referring to when we first got umbrellas. <laughs> we had the we, we made a three arm umbrella. And the the I wish I still I probably still got one. The shaft that held the thing together was an arrow shaft. Or the weight that held together was an arrow shaft. <laughs> and we poured the lead down the arrow shaft. Just some worthless trivia and get the kick out of it. it. We fished them really light because we started fishing them in the spring. So the three arms, and we got all the weight out on them that we could. But those do nicely, put it back there a couple hundred feet, and you can fish it real shallow, which sometimes will make you nice. Yeah, yeah, it won't go, unless you weight it down, it won't go anywhere. Uh, there's also a trend, I'm seeing more and more people take an umbrella and load it up with nine two ounce jigs. The advantage of that is it fishes, I mean, it's almost like a downer. You can actually see it a lot of times on your sonar. 
which gives you the ability to twist and turn if you're following contour lines. That opens up some doors there. Like if you said, okay, we're going to stay in 40 feet. We're going down this bank at 40 feet. Stay 40 feet because you're not, your rig's not back there, and it's not kicking outside when you turn. You know, your rig kind of kicks outside of your turn. The big ones stay right under, and it's more instantaneous. And that gives you the ability to fish two more rigs like you normally do at 100 feet back. You wait two down right here. And it's been my experience most times if they're biting the darn things though and you dial in two's and up. Yeah. And yeah, there's a lot of things you need for them on planer boards, that's something we neglect. We don't do that enough. I think Tom's played with it some. The times I've done it it's work. I just don't do it. The problem with pulling an umbrella on a planer board is you're not looking over there and you don't see that brush pile. If you got four rigs out and you grind one into a brush pile, you gotta clear all that stuff, it's, it's incredibly time consuming. So I think two or three right behind the boat is going to be the maxi maximum spread and effective. Yes, sir. Is there time for red fins or what color? I know you love white. Yeah, and I like, if I had to pick one, bone or that old chrome blue that's always working. And I'm really questioning with red fin if color matters. I think he sees that silhouette up there. Now, yeah, it's time on the calendar, but the fish don't have the right calendar. I, I, I have not seen no fish cooler. Yeah, but now don't get in the habit of thinking you got to see them. Again, going back to the old days, in this temperature range, you know, I'm seeing mid 60s, which is really good for a red thing. Really good. You could just go to a point or a hunt, throw your red thing out there, and they come up and get it. And they'll come out of a lot of water. They'll come out 25, 30 feet. Uh, that, that's been a lousy technique, though. I tried it a couple times and I haven't caught one this, this time. I didn't get many of this spring on it. So I got them in the boat. I'm starting to wonder if we're going to see that. What's catching my eye when I go up lake, particularly all the stripers I'm catching up north are 40, 45. All the bass are 40, 45. I don't know if we're going to get a topwater bite or not. But I'll keep it in the boat. If it's going to happen, it'll happen now. Pretty simple. Just the optimal temperature. Yes, sir. For night fishing, have you used any, any fluorescent lures? Have you done anything? Yeah, we play around with a lot of stuff. Uh, fluorescent lures. We actually make a night glow, glow trailer. It's pretty cool. I caught a fish with them, but it's a good concept. <laughs> <laughs> I've not been able to make it work. It's just. I mean, say, uh, it was called an alligator lure, where you uh, flash it with an old camera, glows up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Out, yeah. And then start pulling that in. No, we played around with stuff like that, and they look great in the water. I can't imagine. And I've caught some fish doing that. Uh, and, you know, I've tried lights, putting lights on lures. It's uh, makes great sense to me, but you know, it is <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the other thing I was talking about, bomber fish. Which a lot of that, that's now, and the old adage is the bomber will work when the World Series is on. And that's fairly accurate. And that goes back again to the old days when the Braves used to be in the series, and we'd all, <laughs> when we'd all be out there at night, and you, it's amazing, you could hear radios all over the lake, everybody out there catching the bombers looking at and I've been a couple times, and that is red hot. If y'all haven't tried it, I haven't caught a fish bigger than two and a half pounds. It's a drawback, but they're just lit up. You can go to almost any place where they're sink and light them up. Yeah, like, yeah. How long does that uh, bite usually go for? It, that's a great question. How long does the bomber bite last? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It will start earlier than a lot of people think. Uh, I'll call them as early as late with that. If the water's below 80, there's a good chance you can make it work, but you're probably going to catch little fish almost exclusively until the water gets down to about 70 or 72. Then the big ones will get up there with them. It will stay strong, and when I say strong, your greatest numbers will last until the water gets down to 60 or 58 or 56. It keeps working after that, but now we're getting in December, one you'll pay a price for it. But the average size of the bite you get in the winter, and you won't need any measuring boards. They're pigs. But you're going in, into a deal from catching 20 to catching one or two, and you're freezing your backside off to do it. But that is, and see, this all started, okay, let's go back to BH, okay? <laughs> and, uh, a lot of you know Reggie Weaver. He used to be our biologist. Reggie was a, a great guy. I thought he did a good job with the lake. He was from Tennessee, and that those guys are big on that stuff. I don't know why. I don't think he's ever taught them they'd catch them in the summer when he's waiting <laughs> sharks. But that's what we used to do. We and not only that, we picked the purpose on purpose. We picked the most wretched, miserable night. If it was snowing, that was fabulous. If the wind was out, if it was, you know, 
No, we didn't want a nice compromise. We want. And we actually did that over and over and over again. And, uh, and it took us a while to figure it out. Now, and this goes back when we didn't have a lot of fish. We Our average size was massive. A lot of nights you were fishing for one or two bites. So he was big when we got him. And then we figured out. Then our density got up, too. That was back when we didn't have a lot of fish. Our density, this goes back now. We're going back to the 70s. And then in the 80s where we got enough fish that you could actually catch six or eight in a day, which was a big deal back then. And then we figured out how to catch them in the summer, and that really cold night thing kind of went by the wayside. But yeah, if you just want to have fun right now and catch a nice night, take you a 16A bomber, go out there and sand. Sand's the key. Now, that it, this is a theory, but if you'll try this, you'll probably agree with me. The reason they go to sand, if you, let's say you get your bomber hung, which is hard to do on sand, but somebody might could do it. Uh, he'll find that one twig up there. Well, he don't, he's too cheap to break his $5 bomber off, so he's going to go up there with a spotlight looking for his bomb. And what you'll see are gizzard cat. Nice ones like that. Onesies, twosies, threesies running around that sand. I don't know what they're doing up there. I don't know if they're eating something. I don't know if they're playing. But they're there, and I think that's why the striker's there. You might notice, even now, you're going to go out and throw a bomber. You're going to catch a ton of fish like this. And you think, wow. And, and, for everyone you catch, you're going to miss three. If it's not the car, the bomber can't get hooked on He's too little. So you think, I'm going to switch to a smaller club and catch all of them. They won't bite it. I tried throwing a big stick. I got the same number of bites. And I think it's because they're keyed in on those kids. Now, that's not to say that's always the case. And that 16A bomber's hard to beat. Mix stick's good. Uh, uh, oh, gosh, what's the other club? Uh, an 18S with power. Most, are, most people know that. You know, all y'all over little, little original, original floating repellent. Been around seven million years. Well, they make that in a size 18. It's about the same size as a bomber. That's a good one. Uh, I tried taking the hooks off my bomber and putting little hooks on it, thinking, okay, they'll eat the bigger bait, but they can't get that hook in them out. They're too little. And that didn't work out too well for me either. Not only did I not catch any more, it messed the action of the plug up enough I didn't get any bites. So that's the problem. But it's great fun. It's very entertaining. If you catch a nice night, you might want to try it. Uh, I got a couple of buddies out there tonight. And now we're in, we're in the temperature range where those big ones ought to get shallow. Uh, but I haven't seen it yet. So whether or not they will, who knows. There's so many fish on those humps. And I wonder if the water quality is really good down there. And they're eating enough during the day. They don't have to get up at night and roam around. In the past, I felt like the bomber thing worked in the fall because when the lake turned over and the water quality was so poor, Fish don't do much. They're inactive. They, uh, uh, the way Reggie explained it to me, you got bad water. It's not bad enough to kill them. But it'd be like if we had a, uh, a heater in here that was cranking out CO2, not enough to kill us, but we might feel bad. We wouldn't want to eat that pizza. We just feel bad. We're going to go home and lay down. That's how. That's the analogy I have. But they, and they won't get shallow during the day because of the sun and the water quality. So they stay deep. And as soon as it got dark, they all go start roaming around the banks. And you'll notice a lot of nights, your best bite will be from dark until 9.30 or 10. Now, you might catch them all night. There might be peaks activity during the night. But I think that's because they all go at once because they're hungry. And that first two or three places, you just wear them out. Then it'd settle down you'd beat out fish all night and send double. But that was the thinking there. And this year, I wonder if there's such good water quality and there's bait down there that they're not moving. Because I haven't talked to anybody that's caught a big fish on the bottom. And it's never been a great way to catch a lot of big ones. It's more, but it's still lots of, you know, teenagers. So it's a good pattern. Yeah. You used to occasionally scream like a little girl when they get right at the boat. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, after you've gone a little while without a bite, and they're bad to do this. Particularly, you might be sitting in, and this is this is the other thing. This is kind of hard concept. To get. They'll get really, really shallow. A foot or two. I mean, right up on that sand. Your plug will be grinding in the bottom like you're a bass guy cranking crank back in those. They'll be rooting in the bottom. They'll go up there and get it. You'll hear him. When he hits your plug, you'll hear him before you feel him sometimes. It's that shallow. His momentum will carry him out of the water. But you're sitting in five feet and you're talking. And you'll buy it right. I'm talking about that much line out. And yeah, that'll wake you up, especially if it is a 15 pound. But it's a really fun pattern. You know, I think everything's magnified or enhanced at night. So, you know, even a few pounds are sitting here. Oh, that's a big one. It's a two pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're a bro rig fishing. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. It's, so it's all over already. I know it was doing well on the south end, but. I, I think the difference is, and Buck had a good day up late the other day pulling the ridge. Uh, the difference right now, when you go up there, the way the 
topography of the lake is, you don't have near as many big main lake high spots up there because the lake next down. So it's more of a deploy points and uh, banks. <coughs> it's going to have a bank to fall according to the concept. And what you probably find when you're doing that, you've been on a bank forever, and then there'll be a place where it flattens out. Maybe not even a point, but flat. They'll usually be on that brush. But yeah, it's working. Historically, umbrellas produce really well from Thanksgiving into February. So theoretically, we might have, you know, this might last. And I think an umbrella is always a Bible technique. And, and I'm not saying you fish them all day, every day, but um, <coughs> it's, like, it's like any other bait. Uh, sometimes it's a primary weapon. Sometimes it's a secondary technique. But you've got both, at least give yourself that option. What it does do is the greatest search tool ever made. I do this all the time. You see them with a rig? Reel them in, put bait on. Reel them in, cast them. You don't have to. But we found them. Because let's face it, bait can be, uh, I think in deep water, a very ineffective search tool. Because you're going two miles an hour with a rig, or a point two miles, point five, whatever. With a rig, we're saturating an area to where we can either find them and determine if this is a good place to be or do we need to cut our losses and get out. So it's also great if you're fishing in the wind. You probably had it where you're, whatever you were trying to do was compromised by wind, whether it's live bait fish or casting. When you get a day where it's blowing 18 to 20 and you're trying to fish the main lake, I think those kind of things can compromise. Well, you can, you can pull a rig in some pretty sloppy conditions. It might not be pretty, but it's effective, whereas casting or fishing bait may not. It gets compromised. Keep them in your boat. It's just, you know, don't stop doing any of the things you're doing. But if you're not pulling a rig, add it to what you're doing. It just makes you a better fisherman. It gives you all kinds of options. Because so, look, I'll be the first to tell you, I'd rather catch a fish doing some of the stuff we're talking My favorite way to catch them is probably with a bucktail, casting a bucktail on the back of the creek. Uh, and I love topwater fishing, which I'm out of luck now, <laughs> evidently. But, uh, and, and, just keep, just, they don't take up much room, they don't eat anything, leave them in the boat, have them in there all the time. Because they will catch you some fish, yeah, Brett. You know, one thing, as far as top water fishing goes, a lot of times when you're seeing fish breaking top water, they're not feeding on the top. The water isn't getting all churned up like it's a blender and you don't see bait coming out of the water. They're not really eating on the surface. You know, using back down to you going after that piece of pizza. Mac was charging at that piece of pizza, and he got there first. He wouldn't stop at that piece of pizza. He bounced all through that door to be the first, because he was so much momentum was bouncing through that right. door. That door being the surface of the water, but he fished 12 feet away from there, and that's where the butt tail or the the, the spoon casting into what looks like top one feet of fish is actually dropping down that fish that may be fishing. Eight or ten or that's a good point. He's down in the water they're, column. They're down. The fish you see are the ones that couldn't slow down enough to stop from breaking the water. Because if you don't see the bait coming out of the water, they're not feeding it. Yeah, he's coming up like that. Too much yeah. momentum. You know, that's a good point. If you're catching fish casting into that, if you're catching the fish that shot through and missed the bait and was down eight or ten or fifteen feet deep down, and you just go, well, oh, well, there's one there. I'm going to go catch that. The rest of the fish are feeding, feeding down. So a lot of times, broke the start of the Yeah. So a lot of times when you're seeing fish break, if it doesn't look like there's a blender in the water and you don't see bait coming out of the water, you're just seeing the fish that are crashing through the bait and, and they're not eating on top. And you're also not seeing the ones that are coming out of the top. Exactly. Maybe a lot more on down there than Probably yeah. about 10 for every one you see. Generally, I think so. so. Yeah. I'm, when you pull in your U rig and you run up on a massive pot of bait, do you fish that rig through the bait, under the bait, on the edges of the bait? How do you? You know, usually I don't change anything, Chris, unless I see fish responding to the bait. Uh, you know, obviously you'd like to see that. And I do catch a lot of fish where you draw a big pot of bait and you don't see the fish. See, so yeah, you know, think about it. A lot of times we're not, you know, looking at a big circle of bottom. There's 10 right there, we can't see them, or one. So, unless. You know, maybe if I'm if my rig's way off the bait, or I see usually what, if I see it deeper, I tend to adjust to that. So sometimes I will, but for the most part, I plow through them and just look to see what I see. And, but I will catch a single now and then when I see a big old pile of bait, 30 feet, nothing there. Bam, fish just outside your summer company. But generally, no. I, but now if I see fish, then I'll respond to that. And a lot of times, and now I do this a lot. 
if I see them on those humps and they are 40 feet, I just kick the boat out of gear. I just run back there and kick the reel out of gear and give them another 30 feet. But sometimes I get more bites just taking the boat out of gear and letting the rig fall down and into them. And then he'll either sometimes get bite it when it falls into them, or when you put your boat back in gear and pull it back up to them, then your power rig basically. That rig's coming up to them on this plane. I think that really catches them off guard as opposed to something's moving this way. He's just doing whatever it is they do in there. It comes right there beside his head. It's the same thing. We're forcing him to make a decision really, really quick. I'm going to eat that and let it go. So that's a good question. Because, you know, they all, everything keeps around the bait. But if you don't see the fish in it, I don't know how to react to it. Great question. Not an umbrella question, but trees. Is there a place we can go to find, like, a map of the lake, before they build it, or something, so we can find out where these tree lines are? I don't know of them. I, I don't know if anything has any degree of accuracy. That's a good question, too, because all of you are seeing more and more. Tribe is really related to the trees a lot. Of time. I know the bass do. Even if they're not in them, uh, you know, it's a big dominant structure and they use it. And a lot of times the herring are in those trees. So, uh, And I think everything likes edges. You know, you talk, you talk to a lot of bass guys, they're a big thing now. They get right on the edge of those timber lines and they're fishing right at the bottom, on the bottom. Where there's a good hard line of trees, they're fishing that outside edge. Tom Man kind of developed that pattern. It's a real strong stock. I see stockers doing the same thing sometimes. But I don't know of a good map that will outline that. It would be a very, very rough. There's a patch of timber here. Better Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I think you'd be better off just go out there with your grass and start waiting for it. So, you know, you know, you know your son well enough. You can put it together. They have that one. Old topographical map. Of the the map. core map? Yeah. That's that's the the core map. Yeah. That's where the flood is. The core map's pretty good, what Craig's referring to, the core of engineer, and I think it's still available. I guess you'd have to go to the core office. Oh, uh, the Green Book map? And then you the flood timber. I have that book. No. It's a good map, but doesn't show the No, they've got one. It shows supposedly everything in here. You know, but it's a big green book. Got paid, got paid, got no, this, this is actually a cold out. No, but the detail on it is so poor because everything's so little. It's, it's not much bigger than a traditional map. And it's made like in the 70s, too. So yeah. It's, just really, not a, it's, it's really, really hard to interpret because of its physical size. I mean, you're with a magnifying, yeah. magnifying glass doing that. So that's the only one I know. That's the one I was referring to. But it shows a lot of good stuff. Each page is like 11 by 14. Yeah, I've seen that. And it's in a book. It's, it's much easier to read. And yeah. it's got some good information on it. Right, it just doesn't, it doesn't show The one he's referring to, I believe, does, but between it uh, being a rough estimate of the timber and the physical size of the map, I, I, don't, I don't think he can glean enough information to help you catch a fish. This is one of the, like Pat Bankston showed me one time with the East Fisher way back then. Yeah. When they, they had their original timber line. I bet you a lot of that stuff's been pushed out by the dam order. I mean, the I'm sure it's changed in 50 yeah. years. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, we, we've all done our. Yeah, no problem. We're taking the tops off on one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when it comes, we knock one down a foot or two. That's good. So. Uh, yes, sir. Is the water turnover over, or when would it be? No, it's not over. But I think the lion's share of it is over. Typically. The bulk of the turnover happens in October. When you get below 60 degrees, that's when you really, it's still happening, but it's, the effects of it, the biggest effects of it are over. Uh, Reggie told me to actually completely turn the lake over, it took from mid-September to uh, almost Christmas. Yeah. Completely flipping. But the, there's about six weeks there, most of it in October were happening. What do you I, is mostly bubbles, is that what you know, or? You'll see bubbles, you'll see changes in water color. Water you know, too, you get back to the creek sometimes, you'll see it'll have a, a very different color once you get out of the main lake. The biggest giveaway, I think, is when you drive over to Chattahoochee. When it looks bad, it looks like the pea soup. It's got that really ugly green color, and we're in full turn turnover mode. That's, I think, the greatest indicator. That, and uh, if you call over the Gwinnett County filter plant, they're a real good gauge, because they're measuring, they're constantly measuring the turbidity of the water, because they have to treat it how they treat it is based on stability. And they can tell you what the water quality is. And they're a real good, real good oh, indication. Okay. So, but I don't know if it's any better than the river. But they will tell you, yeah, they're real high. There's this level where they're real low. This year, they had less, ter the turbidity level stayed real low. 
all through October. So something, I don't know what it was, evidently something happened that the infection, the turnover was minimized to some degree. Did the ocean didn't grow good on you? Yeah, the O level stayed really good. I don't know. Yeah, we had, a lake level never got hot. That's what I think it was. We didn't, it wasn't as hot on the surface, and we'd have to ask Patrick about this, but I wonder if that first 30 feet of water never heated up and the quality didn't go down as much. And you might have noticed it after, we, you know, we get that real good deep water summer bite when we're catching 60 to 100 feet. And as soon as that ended, they went and got on the humps in that 30 to 40, maybe 50 foot range. So there must have been really good water there. So they must have had better water than they had in the past years, which is good. So hopefully, uh, I don't think we lose a lot of fish during that time of year, but uh, sometimes they don't gain as much weight. They'll actually separate themselves from the forage base. They might even lose weight. So hopefully it, it made for a stronger population. And it looks good. There's uh, there's still a good number of nice fish out there. Uh, I felt like we did better this summer than we did last year. So everything looks really good. The lake looks good. I'm really excited about the future. So we got uh, some good fish. Just can't fish find no big fish. That'll happen soon enough. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm really impressed with the little look back there on that board. <laughs> 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 They'll get there. They're getting way quick. It looks like to me we've got lots of little ones with a great forage base. And I'm amazed. You know, I started catching those little guys last year in October. I'm amazed how quickly they've grown. And, uh, you know, bass fishing as much as I do, I kept catching them. Not intentionally, but you can just watch them grow and then. You know, we got in the summer, they got big enough to eat a herring or a spoon, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it looks good. And, uh, you, you take all those little ones we got now, and look what we're going to have two years from two now. Two years, that's right. And, and then the class following up, so I, I'm really optimistic about that. That's good to see. We had a couple rough summers there. I think fishing, I know me personally, I didn't catch the fish at 10 and 11. I, uh, I guess, yeah, 10, 11, and 12, I thought it was very so far years. So, you know, just the numbers weren't there. Hopefully we'll do that. But you know, all populations are sick with it. I think like we're very healthy. So we're in good shape and nothing but good things. And we're going to evidently be rewarded for that dip we had in the population, that trough. Now we're coming out, we're going to go through the mountain. So uh, get everything done that you need to do because in the next couple of years, it's, it's just booty on responsibility for fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell your wives I told you that. But I don't think that. So. Have y'all got any more questions or comments? Or I, I brought a couple of rigs. I talked with the folks in Hammond. If you want one, uh, unless Tom's already stolen, they're back there. They said 20% off, which puts them at 24 if you want one, if not. But again, I really appreciate y'all having me out. Keep coming. You keep having me back. I'm impressed. <laughs> but no, I really appreciate what you guys do as a club. You probably don't realize it, but... Uh, Lake Lanier produces some of the finest fishermen in the southeast, uh, maybe the country. I believe, I believe that. I yeah, and it's far up because we have to be versatile. This lake can be free. This lake will make you an angler. But you guys, as a club, in this lake as a whole, we're kind of. I think you kind of set some standards uh, with techniques. A lot of times you're on the front end of things. You're doing things that other people don't do on other lakes. They're behind the curve. And uh, you should be proud of that, and I think you're a good voice for our industry, and, and I like some of the things you do with conservation. I'm certainly way on the front edge of that, and, and that's great. And uh, you know, I, I appreciate what y'all do collectively as a group. And just remember that. You're some of the finest anglers in the southeast. I'd take that against anybody. And same, you look at our bass guys. We produce a lot of good bass guys. So uh, let's keep Lake Lanier in the forefront. And, uh, but be proud of what you do. And thanks again. And again, I appreciate your support, Captain. Appreciate you, Jim.